morning and thank you for joining us for week number three of isolation due to the coronavirus in our country. Uh, we're hoping to get back into our buildings soon so that we can worship in a in a face-to-face -face rather than this kind of a broadcast uh, way. Um, this is still new to us in the way we broadcast this and I'm kind of enlisting your help today. I hope you'll be able to uh, uh, generate some th uh, some uh, two-way communication so that we can hear your ideas, also get your prayer requests and any information that you'd like to share with us. You can do that by email or by calls. Um, you have our phone number. Um, if you will, notice in your email there were some uh, uh, materials that you were given a worship schedule of uh, how we are going to worship and also for those who are homebound and uh, in the hospital or um, in hospice we have uh, managed to send them printed materials which includes a copy of the sermon and also a wonderful resource given by the uh, United Methodist Church Discipleship Ministries on the Love Feast. Love Feast, uh, because we're not able to share communion in this kind of a worship service uh, where we're not in person, in fellowship together, um, the Love Feast is an excellent way for us to remember the Lord's gift to us. There's uh, instructions and suggested verses and topics um, how to share the Love Feast together, and I would encourage you to take a look at that and perhaps use it. All right. Let's begin our worship. And it's time for the children's sermon. Hi guys, it's Pastor Russell again. I have a question for you. Do you ever worry? I have to admit, sometimes I do. I don't know what you worry about, but I worry about my family. I worry about my kids and my grandkids. I worry about a lot of things, about what Elizabeth is going to fix for dinner tonight. I wonder what you worry about. Do you worry about things at school? Or maybe somebody is a, kind of a, a bad person to you, bullying, that kind of thing. Do you worry about whether you'll fail a test, you worry about getting a good enough grade, you worry about some of the stuff that you hear other people talking about, about the virus that's going around and whether you're gonna get sick. Well, one of the things I've learned is that some stuff is gonna happen, no matter whether we worry about it or not, but most stuff that we worry about never does happen. That doesn't mean that we ought to never think about things and never take precautions or be careful at times. It doesn't mean we shouldn't use good common sense. But what it means most of all is that we have to have faith in God because He really does love us. In a moment or so, we're going to be singing a hymn, and I just wanted to read you a little bit of that hymn. Listen to this. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the ways you've trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. So, did you get the message? When you start to worry, have faith in God.
we take time to pray for one another, just a simple word about uh, our faithfulness in giving uh, is a well-documented fact that uh, during times like this, when the churches do not meet, that generally speaking, tithes and offerings do go down. Let me encourage you to send your tithe to your church treasurer. The address is in the information you received in the email, or you can actually go online these days and uh, give to Mount Zion or Pleasant Hill. Let me uh, direct you to that bulletin for that information. You can follow the links there. We pray for each other, and the way we pray for each other is we will call the names of those on our prayer list. And uh, as a response, we invite you, as Elizabeth is going to do, as I call the name of each person, she will respond with the first name of that person. We invite you to do this. We do this in church when we're actually able to be together. So let's join together and do that now. Let's bow as we pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you give us in um, so many different ways. Lord, we thank you for our life and our health. We thank you for the food that we receive and the fact that in this country we are so blessed with plenty of food. And uh, Lord, you have seen fit to um, bless this nation and we do pray for her. We pray for this nation, the health of it. We pray for your blessing upon it. We pray for our obedience to you. We pray for our leaders that they might lead us in godly ways. Father, as we bow our, our, as we bow our hearts and our heads, we remember those who are on our prayer list from Mount Zion Church, we are praying for those who are either sick or in hospital. We pray for Corey Witten. Corey. We pray for Billy Witten. Billy. Winford Dixon. Winford. Carolyn Ingle. Carolyn. Ted Bean. Ted. Barbara Fry. Barbara. Bo Frazier. Bo. Cleo Brown. Cleo. Carol Brady. Carol. And Arthur Smith. Arthur. Lord, we pray for those who are homebound or in nursing homes. We pray for Robert and Betty Kibbett. Robert and Betty. Kat Brown. Kat. Charles Gatlin. Charles. Linda Brown. Linda. Margaret Brown. Margaret. Larry Davis. Larry. And Betty Teague. Betty Teague. Lord, we pray for uh, those folks around the world who are serving in various ways. We pray for Samantha Klim. Sammy. We pray for Amy Brewer. Amy. We pray, Lord, for our military. Zachary Miller. Zach. We pray for Peter Wilkham. Peter. We pray for Chris Klim. Chris. Lord, we remember those from the Pleasant Hill Congregation, Abigail Hawk. Abigail. We remember Rick Harlow. Rick. We remember those in homebound who are homebound or in nursing homes. We pray for Ruth Adams. Ruth. And Harold Gray. <clears throat> Harold. And Father, we remember to pray for those in the medical field. We pray for those doctors and nurses and researchers and all who labor so diligently, so faithfully to find a cure for what's going on all throughout this world. Father, bless them, keep them safe. And Lord, of all things, we remember that our need is to pray constantly. And so Father, with the confidence of children of God, we offer our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our lection this morning is from Psalm 130, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of all our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Our second reading, Our second reading is from Romans 8. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you're not controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life, because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For our message this morning, we are in Numbers chapter 21, and we're thinking about COVID-19 and the cross. The Old Testament reading, Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with a long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There's nothing here to eat and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Reminds me so much of my mother. Whenever I complained, she said, you're complaining? I'll give you something to complain about. Well, the Lord sent poisonous snakes to the complainers, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We've sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Please pray the Lord take away the snakes. Sounds like me apologizing to my mother. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake of bronze and attached it to a pole, and then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. This is the word of God. I know how Moses felt. The church I was serving in 2003 had both Sunday morning and Sunday evening sermons or services. And one Sunday evening, the crowd of folks that were gathering was a little bit larger than the typical crowd. And boy, I was anticipating just a wonderful time of worship and fellowship. As the pianist was starting her two minute prelude, one of the church leaders came to me and said, uh, preacher, we got a little problem. Now, those are the last words a preacher wants to hear 120 seconds before worship begins. The bride's room downstairs was where I saw the little problem. Don and Jeff, two of the church deacons, were down on all fours. <laughs> Don had a ruler in his hand, and Jeff had a Tupperware. As I moved into the room, something in front of these two men jumped, and the two deacons jumped about four feet in the air like surprised cats. When they jumped, I could see clearly the little problem. It was about a six-inch snake. Don had the ruler, and he was kind of trying to push it over towards where Jeff was, who had the Tupperware. He's going to put it on top and capture it. Man, when they jumped and I saw that little problem, all I could think of was the heading of the Thomasville Times on Monday morning. 
Baptist deacons can't handle snakes anymore. <laughs> These days we're dealing with a new snake, so to speak. President Trump has called it the invisible enemy. For all accounts, the coronavirus does act like a snake, doesn't it? It's sneaky. It takes up to 14 days to show symptoms. It's indiscriminate. It will bite whatever rubs up against it. And it's, like many snakes, deadly. And if you've ever taken the time to get to know snakes at all, you understand that they are patient. Snakes will wait for you to move right up next to them. They're really good at camouflage. A few years ago, I was standing in our yard and I was only within a few feet of a copperhead snake that our dog had discovered in the yard. Now, I didn't see it, but Elizabeth was trying to point it out to me and I still couldn't see it. Snakes and Preacher Brownworth have always had short conversations. Generally, whenever I meet a snake, I try to do two things. I try to keep my head and I try to make sure that the snake loses his. Eventually, I introduce that one to my show. And in more than three score and 10 years on this planet, I have not changed my opinion about the relationship I have with snakes. You never debate with a snake. You simply dispatch the bad ones and steer clear of the harmless ones. Where COVID-19 virus is concerned, there is uh, nothing really funny at all. I mean, if you've seen the pictures of what it does to the respiratory system of a human being, you know why this snake of a virus is a killer. It's invasive and it's insidious. It's aggressive as a badger or wolverine, and it's proving harder to dispatch than most sicknesses. And so that brings us to the main point of where we are in the current dilemma. Most of us are hunkered down. We're wearing protective gloves and masks. We're keeping our social distancing up to speed. And we're desperately wondering where the hoarders have hidden the toilet paper. As a society, we have not had this kind of worldwide worry since the mid 14th century when the Black Plague killed upwards of 100 million people. And what's so strange is that we're appalled by that number, a hundred million people. We are concerned for the well-being of life on this planet as we know it, and yet we hardly sniff over the fact that over the last 30 years, at least 10 times that number of lives have been snuffed out by abortionists. One billion lives ended without having a chance to take their first breath. In the wilderness, the, the uh, Israelites complained against their leader Moses and their God, Yahweh. And they asked a loaded question for the ages. They asked this question, did you bring us out here to die? We read in the New Testament, the answer is decidedly yes. <laughs> Jesus told his disciples, his followers, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. So there is a huge connection here that follows at the end of the passage in the book of Numbers. God gave Moses instructions for what ailed the people. He told them to place a replica of a snake on a pole and set up the pole so everybody would know exactly where it is. When they were bitten by a snake, which for us is a metaphor or represents sin, when they were bitten by a snake, they simply looked to the pole to be saved. Now, since the time of Jesus, the church has always advised this way. They say, look to that other pole, look to the cross and be saved. The parting thought here today is that you can see God's pattern in both the Israelites' pole in the wilderness and everybody else's pole at Calvary. God raised the pole for Moses' flock and promised that anybody who looked at it would be saved. And he did the same thing with the cross and the tomb. Anyone who comes in simple faith to the cross, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, will receive mercy, forgiveness, and be born again to eternal health, eternal life. But did you notice, did you notice that God did not remove the snakes? The pole had to stay in place, and God also didn't remove the snakes that you and I have to deal with. Old age, abused children, poverty, sickness, like COVID-19, drug addictions, bank robbers, business cheats, crooked politicians, terrorists. God also left that cross pole in place as a reminder that our disobedience causes consequences. Just like the Israelites who had 
to deal with snakes the rest of their journey, even when our sins are forgiven, we will still see the problems that we've caused and we'll still have to contend with the results that are there. We still have to look to the cross to live. After all, you cannot unring a bell. You cannot unexplode a bomb. Our choices have consequences. So here's how to deal with the COVID-19 anxiety and what the future may or may not hold. And it comes from the 14th century. Dame Julian of Norwich claims to have seen Jesus in a vision in the 14th century during the midst of the bubonic Black Death Plague. And the message that she received has comforted millions of people ever since. She said this, that Jesus said, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Here's how you do that. Here's how you do that in the 21st century. Every day that God gives you breath, as you wake up in the morning, wake up committing to have some faith in God. Just like we sang it. Have faith in God, though all else fail about you. Have faith in God. He provides for his own. He cannot fail, though all kingdoms shall perish. He rules, he reigns upon his throne. Snake on a pole, Savior on a cross. God paints us pictures so we won't miss the point. But there are times when we go into dull periods of forgetfulness. And so God has given it plainly to us, this thought about the picture of the pole, the cross, and the Savior. Through the prophet Micah, he said this, The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. This is how to look to the pole. This is how to look to the cross. Do what is right. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Walking humbly with your God, that's what we call looking to the cross. Like another old gospel song has it, look and live, my brother, look and live. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let it be so in each of our lives. Go in peace and love and joyfully proclaim the Lord Jesus until he comes again. Amen. Thank you all for worshiping with us this week. Have a blessed week.